Right, okay. Um, so yeah, this talk is uh, just about GovCMS, how we architected it, what it is, how it provides benefits to basically everyone in Australia, and also how other countries can sort of take a, take a hint of what we've done for GovCMS and use that for ideas with their, with their own governments. Um, so a little bit about me first. So I started off on the GovCMS project uh, in professional services. So professional services in Acquia is, um, is where we're sort of working with our clients to enable them to you know, develop large sites. We work with partners as well, and we, um, we basically help them to, to uh, put out these large sites and these large platforms. If I go on my Drupal, uh, my Drupal.org profile, and I have a look at the age on there, and it says how long that I've been, been on Drupal.org, I'm almost four years old. So, um, you know, I'm going to celebrate my fourth birthday soon. Most places online, I use this, this username here, Typhonius. It's, it's a long story about how I got it, but we can, we can talk about it later. Um, but the, the sort of the, uh, the key thing about that is that when I invented it, I didn't realize that Typhonius was also a species of toad. Um, which, when people Google me, it's, it's really important for me, to, for me to point out to them that this is me, and these are not me. So it's just, just a little difference there if, if you Google that, uh, that word. So let's today explain a little bit about Acquia, um, and I'll explain a little bit more about who we are and, uh, and what we do. So we founded in 2007, again, as SJ says, by the, the founder of, of Drupal, Dries Vita. Um It's a company that, as well as hosting, we do product, services, training, and certification. So we've got a bunch of products which are going to be you know, integrating around Drupal as, as an open source platform to tie in with things like personalization, to work with sort of large, um, you know, content content databases, uh, products for sort of CDNs and things, um, and then also the training and certification aspects. So we work with partners, and we work with individual people, individual developers, and development teams to upskill them to ensure that they're certified and make sure that um, make sure that you know we can say with um, with sort of good authority that these people know their Drupal. So right now we're a little over 700 employees globally, um, and that's sort of. From, um, from 2007 uh, upwards. In this region here, which is of course the, the only region that matters, we're around 30, a little bit above 30 people. And that's sort of a split. So we're, we're a little slither in the pie globally, but we're sort of growing, growing in the region. Um, and so, so when I started about two and a half years ago with the company, um, we were we were under 10, and now in the region we're, we're sort of above 30, which is great. It means I've got more friends to, um, to hang out with in, uh, in Australia and New Zealand. In Singapore. So, in the beginning, what is GovCMS? Um, GovCMS is both a service and a distribution. So on one hand, we've got the distribution side of it, which is a Drupal distribution that we created specifically for the Australian government. So we built upon, um, built upon sort of existing distributions and existing modules, put in a few little bits of our own, and uh, we created a distribution that we thought would be, would be great for the requirements of the Australian government. Um, it's a service in such a way that it's a, it's a platform. You know, so we provide a platform, a hosted platform, with operational and support SLAs to ensure that all the government sites that come onto the platform will be able to, you know, have that have that um, have that sort of security aspect and that, that sort of maintenance aspect in mind. Um, the other really key thing about it is that it's it's able to be used by all levels of government. So it's not just federal government, you know, the top tiers, it's also state government and local government as well. So anyone who has any kind of government affiliation, we say, yeah, absolutely, jump on the platform. Um, so what has GovCMS created? So we've got a bunch of these links here. These were, these were provided to me by, um, by a, a, a counterpart of mine of the Australian Department of Finance. Um, the Australian government is really trying to pioneer a lot of the, the sort of the open standards and uh, an e-government policy that, um, that the rest of the world maybe hasn't quite caught up into up into yet. So you know we're, we're sort of looking at looking at the way that the Australian government is putting in standards for you know online digital digital um, digital experiences that um, you know as I say the rest of the world is is not quite there. So we're looking at things like responsive. We're looking at things like making sure that sites are accessible and making sure that you know people with disabilities, be they you know colorblindness or, or you know any other any other kind of disabilities, are able to actually access these websites in an equal manner to um, to sort of um, non-handicapped people. So the GovCMS distribution um, 
Right now, it's it's a private distribution, but we're we're working to open source it um, as soon as we can. Actually, uh, we just need a couple of ticks and a couple of final checks on them on some of the security aspects of that. And that's something that what we what we want to do is, as I say, we want to make this an example towards governments around the world. We want to say, here's what we can do. Here's our GovCMS distribution. Here is our, our Drupal code base that is powering the entire Australian government. And you can use it too. You can take it, you can modify it, you can contribute back to it. Um, that's sort of what, what we're hoping for the GovCMS distribution. So we're sort of you know, giving it out to people slightly at the moment, just because it's, um, it's in, in this private distribution waiting, waiting for approval. But eventually we're going to place it on Drupal.org and we're going to place it on GitHub as well. So, um, so everyone can, can download and benefit from it, just in the same way that they do from Drupal Core and the, the Drupal Contrib modules. Um, we will be regularly updating it, so we're going to be managing that code base with the help of our partners. So when security updates come out, we'll be proactively uh, making sure that they're ready. And, um, and you know, feature enhancements, whatever different government departments come along and they say, well, hey, we'd like a, uh, an event calendar, or we'd like you know, this other kind of feature, that will get pushed back into the main repository. The aim there being, the, it be, it's sort of like an upstream repository that anyone can then pull from. So if you have, say, a government department in another country who says, well, I like what Australia's doing, I'll use their code base, they're able to get the benefits of that as well. So talking about government reuse and talking about you know, the, the sort of recycling of, of code and the recycling of, of ideas, so there's this little quote here that, that as I said, my counterpart put together for me to say, um, you know, principle three of the Australian government open source policy. Um, basically, leverage what is already provided for us before building our own thing. So we're leveraging what's provided to us by the Drupal community, and that being Drupal core, and all those contrib modules, and, um, and we're sort of then uh, making that available to all of government. The other thing is that in a lot of government departments as they currently exist, they, get, they kind of go it alone. They say, right, well, we need an event calendar, and we need the ability to sign up to these events, and we need the ability to change the color of our header. And then another government department comes along and they have those exact same three requirements. But because they don't necessarily talk to each other and they have their own internal development teams, they act in a siloed way, doing the same job, you know, doing those same code tasks and giving pretty much the same result. So by having a, an entire platform for the, the entirety of government, when one department says, we'd like the ability to change the color of our header, that code can get put into the repository and then suddenly it's available for everyone else. So there's not this, this sort of need to go it alone for everyone. Everyone is going to be benefiting from the developments of everyone else. So how agencies get on GovCMS? Um, so right now, what they do is they speak to the Department of Finance and they speak to Acquia, and we work out to see whether they're a fit for GovCMS. Because the last thing we want to do is we don't want to put someone on a platform who wouldn't be a good fit for it. And much in the same way that you know, when you're selling Drupal, when you're sort of saying, you know, here's, here's Drupal, here's, here's an option for you. You want to make sure that the requirements that other that, that the, uh, the companies you're working with, the requirements they have, are going to be a good fit for Drupal. Because otherwise, you know, you're, you're mis-selling and they're going to have a terrible experience and they're never going to want to use Drupal again. So we want to make sure that when entities, government entities come on, they're going to be a good fit for GovCMS. And for those that wouldn't be a good, good fit for GovCMS, we say, well, GovCMS isn't really a good fit for you because you have all of these complex integrations with all of these other things. So let's work out how Drupal can best serve you there. Um, one of our aims actually is to have GovCMS being the GovCMS distribution as a base distribution for any of these other government agencies. So they're still able to pull in those changes, and then maybe at some point later on, they're able to come back into GovCMS. And I'll, I'll show a little bit about the, uh, the workflow um, of, uh, of those, those sort of sites. So the problem, the problem that, um, that we're, we're looking to solve with this, um, government online, few questions. So in Singapore, how is, like, this is an open question, how easy is it to use a government website? Like, is it a good experience? Is it something which, which, you, which you necessarily enjoy doing? I mean, yes, no. I think they're pretty good. They're pretty good? Yeah. I wouldn't say I enjoy using it, but no. It works. Which is yeah, it works. It works. Yeah. So this is the question that I asked in Canberra, because, you know, Canberra being very government-centric, um, how many people are working for a government department and who's satisfied with the development of authoring experience? Does anyone here actually work for a government department or work in any Drupal position there? We've got like a lot of raised hands in camera at being the, you know, the center of government, the seat of government. And then when I asked the question about who's satisfied with the development of authoring experience, a lot of those hands went down. 
because some were using Drupal, some weren't, but whether it was a case of training, whether it was a case of um, just the entire site experience, it wasn't something which, which they, were, they were sort of happy with, that they were sort of favorable of. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to take the, take the sort of hints that had been given to us from other places in the world. We wanted to take you know, whitehouse.gov, which is on Drupal, it's open source. We wanted to take gov.uk, which is written in Ruby, and it's, again, it's open source. We, we took a look at these sites, and, um, and that's sort of an entire all of government platform. And this one here, whitehouse.gov, and petitions.whitehouse.gov, it's sort of the, you know, the White House um, front page and also the White House petitions website. We, we looked at these and we thought, all right, well, they've done a great job for their respective countries, putting stake in the ground and saying, we're all in on open source. We're all in on Drupal. We're all in over there, open source and Ruby. You know, we wanted to say, we're going to do the same for Australia, but we're going to do that better. We're going to make it so it's a simple platform for people to get on. It's a simple thing that, that government departments can say, all right, yep, I'll do this. And they, they get on, you know, with a, with a far less sort of barrier to entry. So let's talk about these patterns. So this guy here is a guy called John Sheridan, and he's the CIO, I think, or CTO of the entire Australian government. So a lot of the, 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 uh, the decisions about procurement and a lot of the uh, sort of decisions about open source and cloud and Drupal, they, they sort of go through him and, and stem from him. He had this idea of patterns. So GovCMS patterns. Pattern one is GovCMS out of the box. So we take our GovCMS distribution, and we look at all the things it provides, the government department comes along to us and they say, we'd, we'd like to go on to GovCMS. And we say, what are your requirements? And they're a one-to-one -one match. So that's a pattern one site. A pattern two site is in this sort of transitionary state um, as the platform evolves to meet those requirements. And that being, you know, this here's our GovCMS distribution with, um, with sort of the, the features and, and functionalities that it has. And then we've got this other site over here that matches 99%, but the one thing that they want isn't in GovCMS. And we work with them to advance the platform to get them in, become one of those pattern one sites. And then there's that pattern three example that I explained earlier, which is just a completely custom thing. Again, we're hoping to let them, that they'll leverage the GovCMS distribution, the PHP code base underlying, um, underlying the websites. So they're able to keep drawing on that experience, keep drawing on that, that code reuse. But they're sort of able to, to put in more complex integrations that might not be a good fit for GovCMS. So here's, here's sort of that in, uh, in graphical form. So GovCMS, let's say version 1.0, a pattern one site would fit straight into that. Pattern two, it, you know, at some point in the future when we release 1.1, that's maybe where a pattern two site would come in. And then pattern three is just this sort of completely custom, uh, completely custom build with the hope that at some point in the future, at some version, we can say, all right, well, now our requirements match up, come back in, come onto the platform. So I'm gonna talk a bit about the technical bits. And technical uh, is uh, me being very professional uh, as a technical, uh, technical person with GovCMS. So how do we get many departments onto, onto the one GovCMS? You know, so there's all of these different departments, local, state, federal, and then the, the single platform with the single code base. So one code base, many databases, basically a very, very large multi-site that will power every single, um, every single government department. So our solution for this, this is one of our, one of our sort of products that we, that we provide is the Acquia Client Site Factory. Um, we, uh, we've used Acquia Client Site Factory for a number of, other, number of other clients that we have. So Warner Music is, is a great example of that, whereby they have one code base, and then each website, each of the sort of um, you know, artist websites that they have, whether that's Bruno Mars or Lady Gaga or David Bowie, you can look their sites up. Uh, Justin Bieber, don't look his site up. Mm -hmm. um, you can look, look, at, look at their sites, and they all look completely different. But underneath, they're all running on the same code base. So it's all you know, one single Drupal code base, and all of these sites are running on that, even though they look drastically different. So the site factory itself, um, what it does is it simplifies multi-site. So you know in a typical multi-site how you'd have to sort of you know, create those directories and make sure all the databases were mapped to each other. This does that all automatically. So the, the sort of the, um, the creation of a site is now a button. You know, whoever the client is, whoever has the site factory, they click a button and they say, I'd like a new site. The site gets spun up with the same code base, with a new database, sometimes optionally if they want, with a template of you know, a bunch of, uh, a bunch of uh, sort of you know, layouts and themes and everything built into it and then it's ready to go. It's ready to be developed on if they need to. It's ready to have you know, additional views and panels and things placed in there if they need to. And it's ready to, most importantly, have content put in there. Um, so yeah, as I say, granular access between uh, on-sites and groups. 
which means that one agency could have, say, one or many. So, you know, a, a department with many public-facing websites might want to have, you know, a huge number of sites on the platform, or a small government department might just put one on. Each of these were able to control granularly access, except put granular access controls in place. So each site has their own administration team, each site has their own content editing team, and all of them from the outside look like different sites. Um, yeah, I mentioned site duplication as well. Um, so you know, if you see a site that you like, you can say, I want a copy of that, and I'll build on that. So we have a bunch of template sites as well. One for a minister, one for sort of a, a ministry blog, one for a portfolio site, one for sort of a brochure site. The aim of all of this being, we're going to be reducing the time that it takes for government departments to actually come online, to have that responsive theme, to have all of those access controls in place, and to basically have a site that's ready to go, ready to put content in. So tooling, all of the open source tools that we use to put GovCMS together, this is just a few of them, there's a few sort of other things that I'm sure we've added on since. Key of that being obviously Drupal, so that's going to be our, that's our code base, that's where, where everything is stored. Um, we actually utilize Drush Make, so we don't, we don't have a fully built code base for GovCMS. We have a, a very small, lean Drush Make file, and we run Drush Make to, um, to uh, do all of the imports of, of all of the modules. Um, so the code base itself is very small, very lean. Thing is sort of our, our conductor that runs through everything when we, when we build, build things. So it runs Drush Make, it runs all of our testing. Uh, runs all of our integration with uh, you know distributions and pushing it out to Drupal.org and pushing it out to GitHub. Composer, we obviously use a bunch of, uh, sort of dependencies of Composer with things like Thing, with things like PHPCS. Uh, PHPCS, we make sure that when we have new code on the site, when we're making when we're making new new uh, amendments, when we're making changes to the code or changes to the build script, that all of that is is passing muster. That all of that is. You know, it's it's good code that, that obeys Drupal coding standards and PHP coding standards. Um, Behat is something which I'll explain in a little bit. It's uh, behavioral testing because you know when we push out new code and we add new features, we don't want that to cause a regression to any of our other sites. So we use this behavioral testing to go out and make sure that the updates that we have on the site, the new code that exists, won't affect any of the existing sites on the platform. Git's our version control, and then Travis CI is what we use to, um, to basically run our builds and, and do all our testing automatically. So we fire, we fire our code off to Travis, and then Travis either comes back with a big thumbs up or a thumbs down to say, this code passes tests, or this code doesn't pass tests, don't, don't merge it in. And all of that's managed in, uh, in GitHub. So we do you know, a pull request based workflow where, um, you know, where, where new code sort of comes in and, and then does all the automated tests. As I say, all of this will be open sourced soon, um, probably, you know, I don't really want to put a uh, put a date on it, but hopefully soon. Um, we're just sort of waiting for um, for that sort of final testing to go through. So a little bit of a talk about the GovCMS architecture. Um, so down here on our base platform, this is the AccuAppied Site Factory. So this is all the additional um, the additional components to the AccuAppied Enterprise. So the managed platform that we have that includes all of our SLAs, our 24/7 monitoring and operations team. We're sort of building on top of that to provide that easy multi-site interface. The GovCMS distribution itself, um, we took Drupal, we took um, an existing government distribution called AGov, we took a few ideas from, from AGov, and then we placed it into our GovCMS distribution. Um, on top of that, we're using a lot of GovCMS modules that we've developed to say, okay, well, these things are useful for government, these are the kind of features and functionalities that government departments will want, and then, of course, contract modules. You know, we, we, we're going to be wanting things like views. We're going to be wanting things like display suite. So all of these things we're packaging together to build a GovCMS platform, which exists, which sort of comprises of both platform and then code base on top of that. So here's our funky Git workflow where we pull sort of things in and push things out and everything. Um, as I say, when we when we created the uh, the initial GovCMS build, we took a little bit of AGov, which was the um, this sort of the old gov government distribution that, um, that we drew influence from, mm -hmm. which is Drupal Core and <coughs> Drupal Contra, and then push that out to the GovCMS site factory. And also, you know, if, uh, if those patent three custom builds want it, that's where we say, okay, we'll push that out to you as well. Take advantage of this code base that we've created, pull that into your, uh, into sort of your, your, other, um, your other platforms where you need it. So our patch workflow. So when government departments come to us and they say, "Oh my God, there's a uh, you know there's a security bug fix release. How do we you know what what happens? How, how do we deal with this?" 
And this is something which you know, we obviously had to prepare for, and we obviously had to sort of say, well, it's okay, we've got this in hand, this is how our security workflow, workflow happens. So when, you know, as, as you know, if you're signed up to those emails that ping you every, at about you know, 2 a.m. every Thursday to say all of these modules here need, need updates, um, we, we get all those. And because we have a 24-7 remote administration team who are able to make those hot fixes to our websites and make hot fixes to anyone on our platform for, for Drupal Core and Drupal Contra, that goes out to them and they go and fix, um, they go and sort of fix, that, fix that up for uh, the GovCMS platform. So that sort of goes into GovCMS, here's our GovCMS distribution. Um, normally, normally our patch workflow would go through a governance procedure whereby we'd speak to the government and we'd say, you know, here are some patches, here are some things that we'd like to add to the platform. We analyze requirements and we decide whether it's a good fit for GovCMS. For security patches, we actually bypass that and we go straight to put in the patch because you know, they're, they're wanting a really short SLA on that. So we bypass that procedure and we put in that patch to, um, to fix any security requirement. And that's sort of where the Acquia RA team comes in. Again, because some people, some government agencies aren't hosting on Site Factory, you know, it's open source code, so they're free to take it away, host it internally, host it wherever they want. Um, they're, they're sort of able to pull the latest GovCMS code base down for themselves. Unfortunately, not taking advantage of the Acquia RA because they might be hosting themselves. But they're taking that, they're like that built GovCMS code base and putting, those, uh, putting that to work on their own platform, obviously with their own development teams and things. So who's heard of this saying? There's a model for that. Typical Drupal, Drupal saying where you say, well, I, I need this thing that does this and does this that doesn't do this. And you go, oh, there's a module for that. It's on Drupal Contra, but it's this module here. Um, how, do we, how do we sort of rationalize there's a module for that, for GovCMS? Because if we go to 200 different government departments and we say, got you this website platform, uh, what do you want for it? There's a huge chance that everyone's going to come up with all of these different requirements that would, you know, if we, if we let it happen, would cause the GovCMS code base to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And eventually we'd have, you know, 700 modules on that. And it would be this big, unwieldy beast that we then can't continue to maintain. So our idea around this is that we're going to work with each of the government departments as they come on board. Anyone that doesn't just want the pattern one you know, the 100% match for requirements, anyone that wants anything in addition. We're going to work through their requirements with them and see if we can either, firstly, work their requirements into the existing GovCMS code, i.e. we don't change the code at all, but we, we <coughs> change the way that their Drupal site operates to accommodate them. An example of this would be, you know, using things like Display Suite in a really creative manner to allow... Hello. So we use things like Display Suite in a really creative manner to put out, uh, you know, different different templating things. Rather than create our own custom module that would do these custom templates, we use things like um, we use things like uh, Display Suite and, and other modules that exist in Contra to do that for us. Um, the other thing that, that we have to do is we have to, you know, ensure that the platform itself, as a whole, is well catered for. So we don't necessarily just think on a site-by-site -site basis, whereby each site is their own thing and we'll work out the requirements for them. We need to evaluate the functionality for the platform. We need to make sure that anything that we're adding to the entire platform is going to be beneficial to that entire platform. Sorry. What that requires is for us to keep the code base lean. So all of those modules that were important in our Drush make file, we need to make sure that those things that come in are going to be beneficial to the entire platform. We don't want to be recreating the wheel. We don't want to be sort of creating custom modules where contrib for that already exists. We don't, similarly, we don't want to be creating any custom modules or importing contrib modules where we can manage the functionality of that within the existing code base. What this means, by keeping this code base lean, by keeping the amount of modules in GovCMS small, is any kind of changes that we make to the code base are smaller still. You know, we don't have to test thousands of different sites for all these different permutations of modules because we've got a very small, lean code base. We're still leveraging the community, so we're not you know, going off on our own, creating all these custom modules, and not abiding by that first principle that I mentioned way earlier on about reusing existing code and reusing what other people have already developed for us. And we're remembering what brought us here. We're remembering that you know, right now, as people who work in Drupal, work in the Drupal industry, we're all, you know, the, the whole idea of you know coming for code and sharing code and being open source about that, we keep we're sticking to that, and we're saying, all right, well, I see how Contrib has has used code, 
let's use that. Oh, let's, they, they need a patch here. Well, let's patch that back in the community, and then we'll, we'll draw on that rather than going down our own roads. So we're working very closely with the community there. So talking about testing again, I'm talking about what happens when we deploy new versions of the GovCMS code base, what happens when, we, when we're looking to patch existing versions of the GovCMS code base. We check our code to make sure that it's syntactically correct. Um, the last thing we want to do is roll out a new release that has a missing semicolon. You know, we, we don't want to have any kind of PHP errors that could potentially take down the entire platform. So we run everything through syntax checking to make sure that there's no very basic syntax errors. And uh, again, you know, that's Travis CI that will go through, will run all of those tests and, um, and you know, report back whether it was a good or a bad result, whether it passed the syntax checking. We use PHP CS to do our Drupal coding standards. We hold ourselves to a really high regard with the GovCMS code base. So any new custom code that we put in, we're going to want to make sure that it's going to be abiding by every single one of the Drupal coding standards because we're going to open source this. We're going to let everyone see it. So if we have horrible code in there, um, it's not going to really look very well, not really going to look very good for us. And similarly, if other people download that code and then they're developing it, for me personally, when I read other people's code and it's not, you know, too indents and too indents and a space here, it's absolutely horrible to read. I, I need to sort of reformat it before I can read it properly. So what we're doing is we're making that easier for other developers to get easily get onboarded onto the platform to work with GovCMS. We also analyze it for psychometric complexity. So we use a, a tool called, I think it's PHPMD. Um, what that does is it makes sure that you haven't got you know, 17 nested if loops with lots and lots of different permutations and options and that you have a you know, nice, clean code that, um, that, uh, that won't be complex. You know, it's it's got to be simple, functional code. For behavioral testing, we use Behat. Um, and I'll, I'll quickly touch on Behat right now. Straw poll, who's heard of Behat? So this is a Behat test. Um, this is the test language that you would write. The idea of this being that decision makers and business owners alike Product managers, project you know, program directors, as well as developers, are able to write tests for the site. So this one here. So we have a GovCMS Google Analytics code that goes out in addition to any site-specific Google Analytics code. What this allows us to do is specify that okay, well these 20 sites, these 30 sites, these 40 sites are now on the platform. So we'll get that number going up in terms of page views for not only the individual sites, for the entire platform as a whole. We'll gain analytics from the entire platform. So here's our feature. The feature goes, okay, this is our feature title. We're going to do GovCMS Google Analytics. Our scenario, just a code comment essentially, check that the GA markup appears. Given I go to the home page, so the hat will go to the home page of the website, then the response should contain UA123123. What, what that one did there simply does is it takes a look at the entire response, the entire markup that the page delivers, and we ensure that these letters here, in that order, appear on the page. Similarly, we can check things like 403 pages. We can make sure that if someone tries to go to admin slash config, it's a 403 error, is returned, it's permission denied. We can log into the websites, we can create new users, we can post content, all testing to make sure that you know, the WYSIWYG is there, to make sure that the media library exists, to make sure that the pictures exist. And all of these are going to be written by, they don't have to be written by technical people, they can be written by non-technical people. Um, this language is very simple. You can say, well, here is a, here's, a, here's a list of all the things you can do. Given I go to, the response should contain. Given I log in as, given I log out, um, that kind of thing. Um, it should be fairly easy to put together tests. You don't need to know any of the technical language. You don't need to learn PHP or anything. It's just this very simple, uh, I think it's called Cucumber or Gherkin or something. It's this very simple syntax here. So the benefits of GovCMS. Benefits to agencies, um, and this is something I touched upon a little bit earlier, it's this lengthy procurement procedure. So probably quite similar to you know, regular companies and other, you know, other sort of government departments around the world. When, uh, when an option to change the way things currently are, are running happens, when there's that option to say change the website or go for a new provider for something, the agency has to go through a procurement procedure where they put out a tender, they you know, evaluate responses, and then they choose who they go for. Because the Department of Finance did this already, they did this last year, they put out a large tender and they said, well, we'd like to do, you know, we'd like one GovCMS, please. And they chose Acquia to be the tenderer. They've already gone through that procurement procedure, so other agencies can leverage that, uh, that sort of procurement um, procedure being, being passed and, uh, and 
you know, have, a, have a zero time procurement. They sign a memorandum of understanding with the Department of Finance, and then they can instantly jump onto the GovCMS platform. So there's no sort of waiting around, responding to tenders, writing big lengthy questions. Similarly, there's no security requirements to be, to be evaluated. GovCMS is evaluated, it's IRAP assessed, and uh, you know, we've, we've, we've uh, assessed ourselves against the ISM, which are Australian um, security requirements, similar to kind of FedRAMP in the US. I don't really know what the security requirements are or the security procedures are in Singapore. But again, a similar kind of thing where every government department says, well, we need to be assessed to this level to make sure that our website is safe in the public cloud. What that has the effect of doing is it increases the agility. So if we're managing the code base and the platform is being managed, then the ability to put out content, uh, you know, it, it happens a lot quicker. And similarly, because we're on that GovCMS platform, they don't have to worry about you know, waking up at 2 a.m. to do a security release. They don't need to worry that you know someone's going to have problems with the site, or someone's going to be complaining to them, and they need to they need to sort of answer answer their questions. Because our global support and operations team are the ones who are covering the GovCMS platform and the GovCMS code base. So this is benefits to Australian residents. I say residents and not citizens because I'm not a citizen of Australia. So I uh, I call myself a resident because I live there, but I'm not a citizen yet. Um, it's this familiarity aspect. You know, if I'm, if I'm working uh, on or, or visiting any government website, the idea would be that um, you know, I'm, I'm given a very similar site experience for any site. That's not necessarily the look and feel, because that can change drastically, but it's almost the experience that, that comes with, uh, with being on a government website. This rapid integration and development of the sites, this means that there's, lower, there's sort of less time taken to improve those sites. So there's no more waiting around for months or years to have a new iteration of say the Department of Communications website. They can do it and they just did it in about four months. They just, they just uh, released their version last week. Those savings are then hopefully going to be passed on. So if there's no long, lengthy procurement procedure, if there's no sort of you know, lots of money spent reinventing the wheel for every different, different government department, all of that savings will hopefully be passed on to the residents of the, of the country. <coughs> Benefits to government employees. Um, so we've got a lot of sort of people, a lot of contacts within government who are you know, Drupal developers or, or site maintainers or site admins and things. Um, because it's open source, they have full freedom to contribute if they want to. If they have a particular, a particular sort of need they want to drive, they're absolutely free to do that. It's not a process that is, is made behind closed doors. It's all open, it's all on Drupal.org and GitHub. It's going to be open for them to contribute to if they want. They're able to then use Agile and use sort of modern PHP tooling which will increase their own skill set and make them into better developers. Similarly, that will help with their transferable skills. So if they can say, well, I've worked on a GovCMS website for the last year. They can go to any other government department who's also on GovCMS, and it's relevant experience. And these here being relevant developer experience. And also, it's just good to contribute to open source, because it's something that you can, uh, you can feel good about yourself doing. So benefits to the Drupal community, as I said earlier, it provides a flagship Drupal example, much like the White House site, much like, you know, Gov.uk being flagships for those particular countries. GovCMS is a flagship for Drupal in Australia, a flagship for government and Drupal around the world. It's this example that we're setting to say, look, there's you know these concerns that you have over security, these concerns you have over you know hosting websites in public cloud, these concerns you have over open source. The Australian government has said that we're fine to do that. So what's your problem? You know, where's where's the sort of the issue that you have with uh, with uh, with Drupal and public cloud when the entire government has said, we're getting behind this. Um, there's a mandate to contribute enhancements. So that the guy that we saw earlier, John Sheridan, one of his sort of key, uh, key tenants is that any kind of contribution to GovCMS, any kind of improvement to the entire platform should then be donated back to the community. So we're not gonna be working on our own over here and not sharing anything back. We're gonna be working here, making sure that you know, this is gonna work for GovCMS and then we'll push that back into, into the community. If we need to patch rules module, if we need to patch feeds module, we'll do that. And then we'll push that, that code back into the community to make sure that, again, we're not the only ones benefiting. Other people are benefiting from our enhancements as well. We're increasing skills for developers in Australia. So it's going to be you know, those government departments, those partners that we have who are developing those sites. And that becomes a stake in the ground worldwide. So I know that Singapore has done a, done a sort of a similar thing with, with government um, and, uh, and you know, a, a sort of a platform for, uh, for sites to go on. What we're saying is, this is how we're doing it in Australia. This is our Drupal, our Drupal platform. This is our solution to lots and lots of sites being brought, you know, headfirst into uh, into the 21st century. 
feel free to feel free to copy. Let's let's chat about this. Let's uh, you know let's help you to um, to achieve your achieve your own. So I'll give you these two links here, um, and uh, and these are things which I'll uh, I can sort of provide uh, on on external channels as well. These are the two places where we're going to be providing this. These are this is already both these are already both set up. There's just no code there yet. Um, so the GovCMS GitHub uh, project and then the GovCMS Drupal.org project. They're both sort of ready to uh, ready to have the code placed on them. These things here are the links that are uh, that uh, were sort of referenced earlier on in the uh, in the beginning slides. And then this is all of my information. Mm -hmm. Any questions? So um, I don't have a government, but I have a company. How relevant would uh, GovCMS be? Um, you know, if I want to kind of like uh, structure the uh, internal company site where you know I have policies and procedures and things like that. Sure, absolutely. So would it would it be a you know like a like a multi like a multi a multi um, you know many sites on one platform? Would it just be one site and you're just asking about the governance of that particular site? Um, I guess I'm asking what, what kind of features would that, that could be applicable uh, to a corporation or to a company mm -hmm. that, so, that's on GovCMS. Um, well, in terms of in terms of sort of the government the governance procedure of that, um, what the Australian government are really benefiting from <coughs> there is having this very structured procedure in which new code gets added to the code base. Uh, this procedure where Acquia uh, is is vetting all the code, is security uh, checking all the code, and other people who are merging that code in. And uh, it's also that, that sort of that Drupal knowledge and that Drupal experience where we can say, well, you know, that, that whole keeping the code base lean idea, that this code is going to be good for the platform. So it's having sort of a key trusted advisor, and whether that's sort of the company that, that you're engaging with, um, it's sort of that, that knowledge that they know, well, all right, well, we're going to hand over the governance to you, and we're going to work with you to say, you know, we need these features, and you can be that advisor that says, okay, well, these features maybe not a good fit, so let's put them to the side. Let's bring these ones in and let's use these solutions to um I, to I guess my question maybe more can can I run GovCMS alone on my own server? Yeah, of course. Or yeah. do I need to um, no. subscribe to some service? No no GovCMS is you know it's it's, it's essentially Drupal plus other things. Okay. GovCMS itself uh, consists of both code and platform. Mm -hmm. So it's not just the distribution. So the distribution is just the code base, which anyone is free to download and use on their own platform, in the server in their basement, on their you know, mobile phone if they run Linux on there or whatever. The GovCMS platform is the one that provides the security and assurance, the 24-7 monitoring, the proactive support and operations, right. and, um, and sort of you know, everything else encompassing that. The governance procedure is what sits in front of the code base. So anyone actually using the code base and keeping the code base up to date is still benefiting from that governance, even if they don't sort of have an active stake in that. Uh, is it used for, I mean, when you say government websites, will it also be used, for example, to do passport applications, make appointments you know, with government agencies, for mm -hmm. you know, do, uh, is it used for those sort of things as well? So what we're very aware of is Drupal's place in things. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people, you know, this whole there's a module for Drupal can do anything kind of thing. We're, we're kind of very acutely aware that if you try and tear Drupal in all of these different ways, then that leads to a bad experience because something like passport applications where you need to have super, super secure storage and data processing and transmission of, of you know, very, very personal information, um, or even things like you know, apps for things, Drupal may, may not be the best case there. And certainly the, the, uh, the GovCMS distribution, what uh, the GovCMS platform, what the idea was there is it would be for public, uh, publicly rated websites, so non-secure, non-top secret, just you know, publicly available websites. The idea being that you know we're not trying to do everything because if we try and do everything, we're going to do everything badly. If we try and make a very secure application for doing passports, or drivers' licenses, or births, or deaths, or marriages, or you know anything which is very personal information, at the same time as doing say, oh you know the, the village fate for mm -hmm. our local council is on over here. If we try and do all of those things at once, then we're going to spread ourselves too thin and we're not going to be able to provide a really quality platform mm -hmm. with good code governance and a, and, a, and a good sort of user experience. So for, for us, what we're focusing on in GovCMS is publicly available information, so non-personally identifiable information, uh, essentially for anonymous users. Um, obviously, there's going to be a huge amount of content and content editing and authoring going on underneath because that's what the government departments are doing. They're putting out all of this content and engaging with their users. 
but it's not going to be for sort of people to enter in, you know, their passport numbers or their social securities or that kind of thing. So, uh, the number of custom modules. The number of custom modules. Um, a lot of them, to be honest, are features. So we're, we're, we're heavily using features. So when a, I need to, I need to double check the exact number, but um, I think in total we're at about core contrib custom features and everything, I think it's like 150 or something. Uh, the end of the features being that when a user signs up to GovCMS, when they come onto the platform, or when they download the code base for themselves and, and install it on their laptop or on their own server or in their basement or whatever, then they can enable a bunch of features and just have, you know, news and events and calendars and everything automatically done for them. So this hundred plus module, do you have one single gatekeeper who decides this new functionality is going to be a custom module or is it going to be a quick of an existing module? Yeah, so, um, so if it's, so go back to those patterns and things, if it's a pattern one site, then there's no gatekeeper involved because it's just, okay, we'll use the code base, we'll use whatever's on the code base, we'll manage our Drupal site, we'll be the site builders. If it's a pattern two site where, you know, we need to increase the code base, we need to, you know, level up that code base and put in more functionality and more features for the site's requirements to be matched one-to-one, -one, then we have Acquia and government gatekeepers to ensure that the code that's going in is, is relevant and worthwhile, good quality code, and that it will be of benefit to the entire platform. So the, the, the conversation sort of uh, first starts off non-technically, you know, so we say to the government, well, this agency would like this functionality. Would, would that be a good fit for GovCMS? And we, we chat as Acquia to the Department of Finance, and you know, we, we make sure that this is going to be of benefit to the entire platform. And then it goes over to the technical team, which is myself, and it's uh, a few other people in the region uh, who I can, I can name on sort of you know, one and a half hands. Um, and we, we discuss the best, the best solution for that. Bearing in mind, we're trying to keep the code base lean. We're not trying to add all of these modules all at once. We might be extending a feature or something. We might be patching one of our existing modules, or we might be extending a contrib module and passing those contributions back. So we act as the sort of the, the technical advisor and the gatekeepers to that code base. But it's not to stop other people from contributing. You know, when it goes public, we expect people will be putting in patches, putting in ideas, putting in issues, and there will be the ones to assist and help those people develop their ideas into things that, that will fit into the GovCMS code base. There's, my, there's some info that I probably kind of missed out. Uh, in the diagram, there's a uh, mentioning about AGOF. Can you explain a bit about AGOF, what's uh, specific? Yeah, uh, sure. So, um, so initially, uh, a, a few years ago, a uh, company called Previous Next made a, uh, a Drupal distribution called AGOV, Australian Government kind of thing. Oh. Um, what what we did on top of that is we we saw we saw what kind of idea that was, and we said, well, this is you know this is something which government has, has used already. It's a it's a great stake in the ground for government. Let's build on that. So we took elements of AGOV, and we took elements of, of sort of our own development, our own design, and we made that into the GovCMS distribution. So the the sort of the uh, the uh, the, the base building blocks that we uh, that we use to create the GovCMS distribution, bits of that are from Ada because it, it itself is a Drupal distribution. So you know, again, we're using this whole idea of not rebuilding completely from scratch, but taking you know taking advantage of things that are already provided to us by the community. So it's essentially, it's a, also another Drupal distribution. It is, yeah. So AGOV was another another Drupal distribution, so just the code base, whereas GovCMS is the code base. So we've built on top of that AGOV, uh, AGOV framework mm -hmm. using GovCMS modules, <coughs> GovCMS um, uh, features and things, mm -hmm. and then we, we're putting it on a GovCMS platform. So mm -hmm. it's also the hosted solution. That's GovCMS hosted solution, support, operations, monitoring, security, patching, remote administration, and so on. I just ran out of battery. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> any other questions? Uh, I have some questions regarding your testing. Um, what's your experience with ES so far? Pretty good, actually. Pretty good. In, um, so we, we wrote a, a couple of integrations with Drush. So there's an integration with Drush, and there's an integration that we wrote with something else. Um, basically, that would allow, like the Drush integration allows people to log into websites using the hat, given I log in as a content editor, given I log in as an authenticated user. Um, so it's it's pretty good. We've we've also extended um, sort of the basic the hat classes to be more uh, more sort of um, uh, relevant to a Drupal site because the hat isn't a Drupal specific testing framework. It's sort of a you know a, a fairly open testing framework that can be hit on any site. 
So we've sort of taken that and extended it for Drupal and for Gutsimus. Are there any errors that can be captured using the app but not really captured by a simple test? Um, so it's, it's mainly going to be things like, uh, you know, well, hang on, let me have a think about this. There's things like, uh, mm -hmm. the example you showed earlier about the, mm -hmm. the GA. Yeah, I mean, no, yeah, no, that, that could be done with simple test. Would you my, say it's easier than my question, my question back to you is how easy is it to write a simple test test? And even I, like, I don't find it easy. I think simple test is it's it's pretty, pretty difficult, yeah, it's pretty yeah. tedious, uh, and it's not, it's not something that we want to say to our government departments, oh, if you want to test, just, just use simple test. Because simple test itself is a very specific uh, Drupal thing, it's not even a PHP thing, it's a very specific Drupal thing. So if we're trying to upskill people, in general Drupal, general PHP, general best practices, mm -hmm. then using something like Behat is is going to be going to be sort of uh, more advantageous to developers and, and people who are contributing because it's then transferable to other projects. Like you know Drupal 8 is I think using Behat as well by default. Other sort of PHP frameworks again using Behat as a as sort of a, a testing framework for behavioral behavioral development. And probably most common as well, right? Yeah, exactly. So it's not it's not this very specific thing like simple test. Um, yeah, simple test can uh, can go die. It's horrible. But um, Behat can can do everything that simple test can. Well, that's a good question. Um, I I mean like off the top of my head, I can't think of anything it can't do. But I mean, there's there's so many things that simple test can do. You know, with, but Behat could also do as well. You know, so it can submit forms. It can log into your site. It can yeah. all the basic know, stuff. Well, what, I mean, what it essentially does is it, is it mimics a user. So it mimics the user on, on the front end, given I click this button, given I select these options, given that kind of thing. Whereas simple test does it in a very similar way, but it just does it at, at a PHP level, where it just goes, you know, tick these boxes and then run form submit and so on. Um, last question on testing. Um, I don't think we have actually does a vis visual regression test, right? You guys do any visual regression? How do you mean? Uh, say, because chances are, if let's say Drupal, the code base is really developed using best practices, chances are that uh, there won't be any simple test or behind test in the field. Right? But um, um, there are actually bigger chance that, uh, for example, CSS change, or even in, in the new module version, right, change a little bit of the template structure, yeah. then change the HTML structure so that's, that's interesting, that's something that I didn't put on. So we're, we're trialing something called Phantom, mm -hmm. uh, PhantomJS, um, and we're using a, a thing that I think it was the BBC developed called <coughs> Wraith, um, where what that does is it goes away and it takes screenshots, and then you can give it a margin of error. So you can say, if this differs by 5%, fail the test. Mm -hmm. So we can take two pages, and if the CSS changes such that you know, that circle that you had here is now over here, it will look at those, it will do a comparative analysis, and it will say, this is different by more than our tolerance, fail that test. Sometimes we'll want it, we'll, we'll say, well, okay, it failed, but that's fine, because we did change the CSS on purpose. But if it's the case where, say, a module has changed its CSS or Drupal core in such a way that it's conflicted with, our, with you know, the, the way that we've laid things out, then that comes into play, and we can have a look at those screenshots and go, oh, yeah, yeah, so it did, well, well, let's work on that, let's see what actually changed. So yeah, that's, that's a, a good place where, you know, um, Simple test and behind would uh, would not be able to pick that up. Is it building in this other distribution as well? Um, we what we're doing is we're working on that in a, in a sort of a separate one, okay. in a separate distribution, in a separate not distribution, a separate sort of GitHub project. I see. Um, so we can then sort of fire that off at, at all of our GoSMS sites. Um, but eventually, you know, the aim is again to bring that in and make that available. Thanks. Anyone else? All right, thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, I think Kim has, uh, has some questions to ask. Hard source uh, questions. Yeah, yeah. So, well, you know that we are all community, right? Um, so, I hope you can see me. Okay. Um, Thank <laughs> you.
<laughs> okay, so um, as you all know, we are a community, um, and then of course the community, what we all want is to improve, la, right? To make sure that we have good quality content like this and all the future uh, events and all that, as well as uh, any other activities. So, <laughs> so, so uh, I would like to take to actually share this link with you all. It's actually a survey that we have prepared uh, to solicit feedback uh, from the community. So if you all can spend some time, five minutes, let you see how the survey looks like. It's very really short, la, right? Um, to 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 help us provide some feedback about uh, yeah about yourself, your needs and your challenges as well as um, tell us how 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 do you think about uh, the community so far, or the things that we've been doing. Yeah. So well, that's briefly, la, right? So I'm just gonna leave this. Here for the next few minutes, uh, yeah, the volume of network and all that, right? Yeah, that's all. Okay, thank you. Uh, there is still a little bit of feedback. There's some drink as well. Feel free to just mingle around. I think after this session, some will go down and have uh, some beers as well. See. Okay. Thank, thank you. you everyone for coming. Thanks, Adam, for coming.